the Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I am pleased to participate uh, today in this fourth international NGO forum on economic, social and cultural rights for women. Let me first of all thank Coca Plus International for organizing this event and especially the Presidency. This year's focus on Asian women, together with the past sessions on Africa and Europe and the next on the Americas, will provide a comprehensive understanding of the situation of women throughout the world by sharing experiences from the ground and identifying challenges both at national and international levels that hinder progress in the full enjoyment of women's rights. The global financial, economic, food and climate crisis have seriously affected human rights worldwide, and in particular women who are victims of multiple forms of discrimination. The international community cannot turn a blind eye to feminize poverty and exclusion. I wish you the good way success in this endeavor of raising awareness in, in order to act accordingly and in conformity with international human rights standards. As you know, women's rights and gender issues have been at the top of the agenda of the Human Rights Council as well as for the Uruguayan Presidency of this year pointing out at several existing gaps. Since its establishment, the Council has taken several initiatives in order to effectively contribute to the realization of women's rights and gender equality. For instance, through its Resolution 6 30, the Council requested that its mechanisms systematically integrate a gender perspective into their work. The Council holds an annual discussion on this issue, and this September, on the 20th, the Council will discuss the issue of economic, social and cultural rights of women and empowerment. Through interactive dialogue with various special rapporteurs, including the ones on violence against women, on trafficking of persons, especially women and children, as well as through its thematic <coughs> resolutions, such as those on maternal mortality and the right to education, the Council has been continuously addressing the issue of women's rights and equality. The newly established working group on the issue of discrimination against women in law and in practice, which presented its first report in our June session, constitutes a new tool of universal support, contributing to the removal of obstacles to the full enjoyment of women's rights. Indeed, the working group intends to focus on states' obligation to eliminate discrimination against women in economic and social life, especially in view of the international crisis. Moreover, the Universal Periodic Review, which is valued as having great potential to promote and protect human rights in every corner of the world, has proven very useful to foster a national reflection and dialogue and follow-up on what is sometimes seen as delicate or invisible, uh, are sometimes seen as delicate or invisible issues such as the discrimination of women and girls. Though uh, the women's rights are human rights, there are still numerous obstacles for their full realization. Gender equality and power of empowerment of women is one of the Millennium Development Goals, but a lot remains to be done to reach them by 2008. Other goals are also very much like the ones on education or paternal Despite the obligations that come since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 and the renewal of the political commitment in the Vienna Summit of 1993, as well as in Beijing 1995 and afterwards, socioeconomic and cultural factors are often involved to hamper the effective and full implementation of universally recognized human rights for people. The limited access to education and health, including maternal health, will jeopardize the development of many countries and their future generations. Being access to quality, affordable education, one of the keys to achieve the energies. At the same time, the lack of economic means, women's difficulty in getting equal access to decent jobs, land, property, credits, or new technologies, plus domestic violence, exploitation and harmful traditional practices are other scourges that cannot be silenced. 
Moreover, one has to underline the particularly vulnerable situation of the Vietnam conflict. The negotiations that will soon start in New York over the Sustainable Development Goals after the summit of Rio Plus 20 of last June are aiming to cover the environmental, economic and social dimensions of sustainable development. And this includes human rights and specifically women's rights as agreed in the outcome document of the future we want. They should then contribute to the full implementation of the outcomes of all major summits in the economic, social and environmental fields. <coughs> Efforts at the international level, including the normative framework, must be translated into concrete measures at national level. In this regard, national plans of action and quality of opportunity, integrating the gender perspective and targeting vulnerable groups, as well as poverty reduction plans and strategies, play a fundamental role. In addition, macroeconomic and other public policies should integrate a gender perspective, and gender equality should be a stated objective of all these measures. Women should also be able to participate on an equal footing in the design of these policies. This year's focus on the Asian continent, characterized by its uh, cultural diversity, is an excellent opportunity for us to learn about national and regional initiatives on women's rights and the reform, and on the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals. The establishment in 2009 of the Asian Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights was a significant advancement in placing human rights at the center of the region's agenda. The ongoing drafting process of the Asian ASEAN Human Rights Declaration is a clear step in this direction. This intergovernmental body, together with the ASEAN Committee on Women and the ASEAN Commission on the Promotion and Protection of the Rights of Women and Children, may be also a forum to further discuss and foster women's rights in this region. Of course, sub region, because we are speaking about that. It would be also interesting to take a look at the initiatives launched by Arab women organizations and by Arab women parliamentarians and leaders regarding the political transitions in the Arab world, Michelle Bachelet, UN Women Executive Director, stated a few months ago that women were at the forefront of these movements, leading protests, marches, and social media <coughs> campaigns to change the status quo. And women should be at the forefront now in meaningful political participation so they can help chart the future of their country. The Arab Human Rights Committee, which was established by the Arab Charter on Human Rights in 2004, should help in promoting women's rights. The last but not least, the Organization of Islamic <coughs> Cooperation, the OIC, established in 2012 the Independent Permanent Human Rights Commission, IPHRC, composed of 18 experts from Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. And uh, it will focus on women and children's rights as a priority. To conclude, I hope uh, that these uh, two days will help identify the progress made in the real advancement of economic, <coughs> social, and cultural rights of women in Asia, and to propose measures that will help overcome the obstacles Secretariat of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, which supports the Council and which uh, supports uh, civil society in advancing this mission and uh, this goal with great devotion. Mr. President, uh, Princess Michelina, Your Excellencies Ambassadors to the United Nations and International Organizations in Geneva, distinguished speakers, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to speak to you on behalf of the Secretary General of the ITU, Dr. Hamadou Touré. It is also my privilege as a staff member of the International Telecommunication Union to work for an organization that is determined to harness the full potential of information and communication technologies for the benefit of women and girls. Our aims are no less than to uh, eliminate gender disparities and empower women and girls.
to achieve their goals and meet their aspirations. Let me just tell you about some of the ways that the International Telecommunication Union has promoted women's rights, uh, not forgetting that the right to communicate is a basic human right. We celebrate World Telecommunication and Information Society Day every year on the 17th of May to mark the founding of ITU in 1865. This year, the theme was Women and Girls in Information and Communication Technologies. The event includes designating uh, winners of the World Telecommunication and Information Society Award. This year's winners were very distinguished uh, three women, and one of them is Christina Fernando de Kitchener, uh, president of Argentina. And uh, we had a lady from China, uh, so this is very relevant to this forum, which has a focus on Asia. Uh, her name is San uh, De Fan, and we have Gina Davis. All three women have uh, contributed to providing the best possible opportunities for women around the world to benefit from information and communication technologies. Their efforts have included encouraging women and girls to aspire to technology careers and empowering them to seize every available digital opportunity. The three winners are role models showing why there should be women at the highest echelons of decision making in our societies. Let me just give you a brief account of each of these women. President Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner of Argentina has successfully pushed for information and communication technology development in her country. During her first term in office from 2007 to 2011, mobile connectivity more than doubled from around 23 million to over 55 million mobile cellular subscriptions, giving a penetration rate of over 140% compared with an average of 95% in the Americas region as a whole. Through the Equal Connect program, 3 million Argentine children from low-income families attend free public schools and receive laptops for their personal use. The children keep the laptops when they finish their schooling, and most of these kids are girls. Sanya Fan, chairman of Huawei, a, a Chinese telecommunication company, has been spearheading the management and reforms of this company since 1999, and she has transformed this company from a very small local telecommunications enterprise to a real global, global giant. She's involved in a variety of corporate responsibility programs, uh, and most of them focusing on women. Gina Davis, who maybe some of you would know, is a Hollywood star of films such as Tootsie and Thelma and Louis. She's an Academy Award winner. She's also a world-class athlete, archery his passport. But she received the World Telecommunication and Information Society Award uh, not for her star work, but rather for her work in another, in another entirely different area. And that is her tireless advocacy on behalf of women and girls as founder of the non-for-profit non Gina Davis Institute on Gender in Media. And she's also an official partner of the UN Women in their efforts to change the way the media represent women and girls worldwide. She's also ITU Special Envoy for Women and Girls in the field of information and communication technology. Women and girls are denied access to basic health care and education and to equal opportunities at work. They face discrimination in economic, political, and social decision making and often suffer violence and exclusion. This situation is unacceptable and we must address it with all the means available to us. And those means include information and communication technologies. This is why at ITU, we are focusing on using the power of information and communication technologies to empower women and girls to take their rightful place as equals in their societies 
and economies. Let me quote one of the highest women in our organization. Her name is Doreen Bogdan Martin. She's our chief of strategic planning and membership department. She said recently, today, women perform two thirds of the world's work and produce half of the world's food, but they earn just a tenth of the world's income and they own just 1% of the world's property. In 2011, only 12 of the 4,500 companies had a female chief executive officer. So you can see that the work ahead of us is really tremendous. And it was good to see that all the speakers here have shared uh, examples and lessons learned going forward. Uh, examples from uh, Congo, from Senegal, from Uruguay, um, and also uh, from Switzerland, of course, and uh, the ones also presented by the States in Osa. So um, we want to level that playing field, knowing that jobs in information and communication technologies open up amazing opportunities for women. And here again are some of the things that ITU is doing to improve uh, the lot of women so that they can also participate fully in society. On, on 26th of April this year, ITU launched a new global campaign to attract girls to technology. The campaign is called Technology Needs Girls, but you could also say Girls Need Technology. I think it works both ways. And it has four main areas of focus. The first area is empowerment. And this simply means the power of information and communication technology to improve the lives of women and girls and their communities around the world. The second focus is equality. And this means assure, ensuring that women have full and equal access to the information and opportunities provided by new technologies. The third focus is education. This means giving girls the same educational choices as boys and providing them with positive guidance towards possible careers in information and communication technology. And finally, employment. This means demonstrating that there are exciting and fulfilling careers in the information and communication technology sector, and that this offer excellent opportunities for girls to contribute to society. The Technology Needs Girls campaign was launched on the occasion of what we call Girls in ICT Day, which is celebrated throughout the world on the fourth Thursday of, of April every year. Girls in ICT Day is an international initiative backed by 193 countries, which are the British members of the ITU, and it seeks to create a global environment that empowers and encourages girls and young women to consider careers in technology. More than 1,300 events were held in more than 80 countries this year, and during these events, uh, Senior girls and university students were invited to attend awareness raising conferences. They spent the day at the offices of ICT companies. Uh, some of them were in government agencies or at academic institutions. And uh, they also met female role models in the field of technology in order to better understand the opportunities that this sector holds uh, for their own future. Another campaign called the uh, Telecenter Women Digital Literacy Campaign has been running since April 2011. And this was launched uh, in partnership with the Telecenter Foundation and it aims to give women digital literacy skills and open up the life-changing opportunities offered by technology. As we speak today, there are more than 225,000 women who uh, have benefited from this program and all of them are from developing countries, most of them in Asia. Let me just conclude by highlighting a couple of examples of Asian successes because of this forum will be focusing on Asia. Uh, these examples are gathered from an IT report that is entitled A Bright Future in Information and Communication Technologies, Opportunities for a New Generation of 
In India, for instance, uh, the information and communication technology sector plays a pivotal role in bridging the, the gender divide in the country's workforce by helping to overcome biases against women and girls, especially those from rural or uneducated backgrounds. With women comprising 31% of the ICT workforce in 2009 in India, uh, the sector in that country has achieved one of the highest gender ratios in the Asian region. Girls and women are required to take training courses in computer and ICT engineering. So this is a very uh, encouraging perspective that we are seeing emerging from Asia and which could be replicated in other uh, countries around the world. In the Republic of Korea, another Asian country, a policy on women in science and technology was implemented between 2004 and 2008. The country's current plan includes the establishment of one national and four regional organizations under the umbrella title of the Institute for Supporting Women in Science and Technology. And just one final example, and this is from Philippines, another Asian country, where women account for about 65% of the total professional and technical workers in the uh, information technology services sector. So all these uh, developments that we're seeing in Asia uh, show that technology can help change a lot of women, but we have to embrace technology and uh, we, we have to uh, launch projects in partnership with uh, government, private sector, civil society, I think it's the only way that we can see a meaningful impact. And as our Secretary General, Dr. Tuber, always likes to say, our world can only improve when women and girls are given their right as equal contributors and participants in every area of society. Um, I thank you very much for your kind attention. And I also want to thank uh, Princess Micheline for her excellent organization uh, of this forum and for putting together a wonderful program yet for me. The standard setting and norms of what we're doing. And uh, you have shown quite concretely what an organization like ITU is concretely doing in advancing the empowerment of women uh, in training, in education, uh, in employment. And uh, there's a whole world of intergovernmental organizations and non-governmental organizations that have a role to play in advancing the rights of women. So it's not only, shall we say, the committee of the uh, elimination of discrimination against women, or the Human Rights Committee, which of course has a general comment on uh, Article 3 on the equality of women, etc. It is also these important intergovernmental uh, organizations and of course the NGOs on the ground.